So um, I'm Darren. I'm revered and often worshipped in the Embraco community, as the as the slide demonstrates. Um, I've, I've worked with Embraco since uh, 2006 now, and um, I, I run the the training, the level two training and certification course. Despite the fact I do that, I'm fine in uh, in front of 10 or 15 people, but this kind of crowd panics me slightly. So I will, I will chill out as, as time goes on, hopefully. Might be a slightly nervy start. So uh, Moriyama is the company that I run. We're an Umbraco certified gold partner. We do uh, support training, professional services, hosting. We do rescue missions. You've screwed up Umbraco, we come fix it. All, all of the really glamorous stuff. And um, just, just uh, so I can I try and pitch this appropriately, um, how many people in here would consider themselves to be developers? If, if you're not, then you, you might be in the wrong place, but you'll learn lots of new impressive words for your friends. <laughs> um, no, but anyway, I, I, I'll begin. It will be quite a high level overview and it will become increasingly techy. Um, my opinions are my own. Don't you, don't you think it's funny when people have to write that on their Twitter account? All opinions expressed are my own. Why would you have a Twitter account to express someone else's? But um, I'm just putting this up there. If, if you're easily offended, I kind of want to get into a rant. Something occasionally lets fly and it's not intentional. But if you are easily offended again, you, you might be in the wrong place. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. So um, let's go to the cloud. I mean, you can't do a, an Azure talk without a, a cloud slide or two. Um, basically, before we go into any specifics, I just wanted to do a, something by way of definition. Um, there's, there's kind of cloud and, and cloud service providers. So, um, I mean, basically, we're going to talk about Windows Azure, but I mean, you've got Amazon Web Services and EC2 in particular. Rackspace have a private cloud. Uh, and then there's OpenStack. So OpenStack is basically open source um, and lots of people kind of use it to, to create their own cloud within an organization. So um, I think what I'm trying to say is that lots of people have a, a preconception that by deploying into the cloud, you're handing over your infrastructure um, to someone else, to Microsoft, to Amazon or so on. It's not necessarily the case. I mean, Ubuntu professional services for an extortionate fee will come into your office and set up an OpenStack cloud on your data center and your infrastructure. So everything we talk about, kind of the auto scaling and so on, you can have, but you can kind of contain and control this. So you can get these kind of cloud benefits without, um, you know, putting your trust in, in Microsoft or whoever. There's also uh, Embraco as a service. I, I wasn't here for the first presentation this morning, but I understand there was some technical challenges with uh, the demonstration. Um, I, I've kind of seen various incarnations of it, um, and I have been demoed it at the, the Partner Summit recently in Copenhagen, and it, it's promising, and I think when these guys get it right, it's gonna be a very, very viable option. It's gonna abstract away a lot of the, uh, a lot of the stuff that really I'm gonna talk about when it comes to Azure. It's going to, you know, all those little configurations and so on that you'll have to do with Embraco, Obviously, the, this is built and run by the core team. So that will, uh, but I can't, honestly, I wanted to, again, have it up on screen and it, it's not quite come in time. So um, this talk, I'm kind of going to wander around here and look really techy and clever because I know all this stuff, but um, we have to give some credit where credit's due. These are my open source cloud heroes, uh, Pete. Steve, Jevon, I think a couple of them are, are back there, so go and say thanks to them. If you get anything useful out of this talk, we kind of bounce stuff off um, each other on Skype. And also the Embraco logo, all of the guys at HQ. Uh, basically, I don't know whether I should admit this because there's a couple of them here, but my, my technique for finding stuff out is just to Skype them until they get annoyed of me and, and answer me. Um, but no, they've all been really helpful in, in kind of finally getting this information together. 
I promise I'll, st I'll start saying something slightly tangible in a minute. Um, just wanted to say that this is a, obviously a changing landscape. Um, in fact, there was a, a release of uh, some features to Azure websites that basically changed the conclusion, and I found this out yesterday. So <laughs> you, you can't just kind of take anything that I say as a boilerplate for the, for the next couple of years just because you, you, know, you need to, to read. Um, and the other thing I'd say is, is call me out because, again, just, just before I was talking, I, I had a conversation with Jevon and said a couple of things, and he went, no, that's actually not quite right. So um, if, if I say something during the presentation that you think is fundamentally wrong or you disagree with, please just stick your hand up and, and butt in. I'd much prefer that this was a, a form of truth rather than a kind of dictatorship of, of some sort. I'm going to say Azure. You can say Azure, which is like a deodorant brand or something, or as you are. But I think apparently Steve Ballmer gets really pissed off unless you do the Azure. So it has to be Azure and will be throughout the rest of the talk. Um, so yeah, when I say cloud, because um, Azure is a cloud service, um, what, what am I talking about really? And, and why would I... Why would I not just um, stick my Embraco site on a uh, on a server that I had bought in in PC World? And you know, there's a number of reasons, and I've tried to to sum some of them up here. So um, resilience, um, I guess, is is the is kind of ties into scalability a bit. If you have uh, unexpected increase in traffic, then you you can kind of quickly allocate more resources to your system and, and kind of grow with demand. But the kind of reverse of that is, is there can be a cost benefit because you can, during unexceptional times and, and regular traffic, you can, uh, you can reduce that capacity also and you can save yourself something in terms of cost. I think the agility is, is quite a powerful idea. Um, Temporary websites, for example, you know, a website doesn't always have a, a lifetime of several years. Uh, for example, Virgin Media, who we work with, they, they send out a, a mail shop for new 100 meg broadband, and they don't want people phoning up their call centers because, you know, when that mail shop goes out, they blanket the country. So they direct traffic to the web. That leaflet drops through your, your box, your letterbox, and... Um, a week later, no one's visiting the site again. So you get millions of people for a, f a couple of days, basically. So the agility is quite compelling. The ability to, with those resources, temporarily allocate them and actually hopefully deploy there really quickly. And when that demand is gone, just to, to kind of take those resources back and use them for your next temporary, temporary offering. And kind of lastly, functionality, because um, uh, as we start to talk about Azure, I'm really working hard on that hard pronunciation of AZ. It doesn't come natural to a South South Londoner, to be honest. Um, you, you get lots of stuff built in. You get lots of features and functionality that you actually you couldn't really build uh, by yourself very easily. I'll, I'll have some examples of that later, hopefully. I uh, covered that coming soon. Looks good. Lots of can't help noticing that you two guys are there, and I didn't see the demo this morning, but um, again, ask the guys from Embraco about it because I really haven't had the opportunity to to kind of log on and, and have a play with it just yet. So what is Azure? It's a shipping container. It's a magic shipping container. <laughs> I think that is actually, um, that's actually what they put the real servers in. Um, and when they need more, they just drop one of these shipping containers in. They stack them up and they plug them in. But it's just dozens and dozens of real servers, right? There's nothing, there's nothing particularly, particularly special about that. Um, right at the end, I will kind of go through some more features. That is quite special. You think so? <laughs> yeah. I like the, the fact it looks like these guys have gone for a tour of the, the shipping container. It's, it's like the Microsoft Museum and, you know, the tour guide takes you around the Azure server container. 
Oh, don't laugh, it would be some people's kind of perfect day out. <laughs> and at the end, they'd get to kind of meet and greet with Bill, kind of cheese and wine. It would be some, some people's wet dream. <laughs> Sorry? Yep, fair point. Those guys could say that they've been in the cloud. So, um, but anyway, it's not just a bunch of servers, it's a whole load of, of services. Um, and we're, I'm shortly going to become very Embraco specific about Azure. And at the end, I think I've got a slide with all the other stuff it does in summary. So it's not just a web host, it's everything you could ever imagine to do with deploying and, and managing infrastructure. So um, I'm an advocate of, of using Azure to, to deploy in Braco. And um, I think the top reason really, uh, as opposed to other cloud services out there, is SQL Azure because um, I'm, I'm able, you know, it, you know, I have a high availability SQL Server. One of the core components of deploying load balanced in Braco is, you know, is a, a shared SQL Server often. Um, one of the powerful features of SQL Azure is um, you can now synchronize your SQL Azure to an on-premise regular SQL Server. So again, one of the things you often want to do with Embraco is develop against current or recent-ish live content. So it's quite nice to set up these either mirrored or on-interval synchronizations into your own infrastructure. You can actually, um, you know, you can join your own corporate domains into a kind of Azure domain and build all that trust, that's kind of magic stuff I don't really know about. But it is really easy compared to, um, again, I really like EC2. EC2 is a good, a good deployment, but um, I don't know, at least the current release of Azure is easy to use, but um, probably most importantly, our current deployments in there, they just, do I really want to say this and curse it? Yes, I do, yeah. They just don't go down. Mark, have you got the, the phone out for pingdom alerts? Yeah. <laughs> we, we do monitor. They just don't go down. I'll do it again. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, sorry, I'm just I'm getting dry throat. Give me a moment. So I remembered I was supposed to to pause once in a while to make this kind of string out and actually speak for an hour. I have a great history of cramming an hour into 30 minutes, which is probably a good thing today. I heard a few sniggers there about cramming an hour into 30 minutes. God only knows what you were thinking about. So uh, does, does Embraco work with Azure? Yes? So any questions? Um, I'm just kidding. I couldn't find a, an amusing backdrop picture for just kidding. It was all kind of... My, my strategy for background slides is go on Google Images and search for the actual title of the slide and obviously contact the people who took the photographs and license them correctly. So, um, Embraco and Azure, there are three flavors of, uh, of deployment, at least the way I see it just now. Um, so back in the day, there was there was one. When when we got kind of our first our first taste of Azure, um, and what you would basically have was this wonderfully holistic thing called blob storage, which is just a place where you could put some files, um, and then you could kind of configure a deployment to spin up multiple IS servers. Um, but you couldn't map this as a drive in any way. So you had all of your Embraco files sitting somewhere and you had all of these kind of IS servers and you had to have a solution uh, to get those files out to the IS servers. And this was called the Embraco Accelerator. How many people have worked with the Embraco Accelerator? <laughs> these people, uh, three, of three I think I saw, veterans of the of the Embraco Azure world. Um, it, it had code like this in it. This is a method called uh, try five times that gets past an action and then it tries to do something five times and if it can't do it, then it gives up. A and that was the kind of uh, the level we were talking about. I mean, 
So basically, the, 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 the point for me was that um, you had that, that blob storage in the middle, and basically, you had custom code that was trying to sync any read and write out to, to all of the instances locally. Um, and it kind of, it kind of works. Um, because, you know, normally if you try anything five times, then then it's enough. We actually overloaded this. We added a second parameter, which is an integer, and called it try as many times as this. And, and 10 always worked. But, you know, there's, there's kind of not, not a great feeling about when you look at that kind of stuff. And we cleaned it up a bit, and we put it up on Bitbucket. Um, I know some kind of big sites run run with this today. It does work. Uh, my feeling about it is it was release one, it was bleeding edge, it was a bit techy to deploy. You could deploy it, but you had to be quite techy. Um, so, uh, oh, that's, that's scale. So that's to remind me to talk about scale. I think the problem was scaling. <laughs> I tell you, this was this was done relatively late last night. You know, it's uh, <laughs> give, give me a break. You don't think I was prepared and actually wrote this a, a few weeks ago, do you? Um, so I think to understand the problems with scaling, you have to just take a quick step back and look at uh, lo how you load balance and Braco, because I kind of I'm assuming if you you want to auto scale, you can obviously size your deployment, but probably actually you want to have a, a load balanced and Braco set up in the cloud for a bit of redundancy. And again, load balancing, you all said your developers. So the idea is a request comes in and it gets sent to, to one of a number of servers. We don't just have a single, a single big server. So, um, sorry, I'm just going to check how I'm doing for time because I've got no idea. I think that's all right. Oh, no, I'm supposed to be finished. <laughs> I'll speed up a bit. So, um, and Braco load balancing, there's uh, some special requirements. Special, is that the right word? There are some requirements. Um, you need some sort of uh, shared storage, normally, for your different, for your different web servers. And that's normally DFS, distributed file system, to sync stuff across the actual servers, or some sort of SAN, some attached network storage. And you can get all of your IS servers to look at that. You need a shared database between these instances because uh, Mbraco stores its content there and when stuff gets published, Mbraco builds its cache from that database. The servers need to be able to communicate with one another. Your IS servers need to be able to talk because when a publish happens on one server, that server needs to talk to the other ones, the other IS servers, and tell them to update their cache. Otherwise, you'll get inconsistent content. Um, you need to exclude certain files from this file sharing. Um, so for example, you, you can't have examine that just five different servers writing into a shared examine index. You, you kind of normally, in a typical load balanced setup, you just kind of point examine locally on each instance and let each instance have its own examine. And, and typically media as well, you might want to push off to a, a CDN or something like that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to glance over to Morton in a minute, but I mean, to, to date, my understanding is, is typically you want to route all of your, your Embraco traffic through one back office instance. So if you're using the back office, you want to make sure the person I is getting sent to one of your IS servers and not round robin across all of them or not kind of, you know, one user getting one server and one the other. This is improving. I know Embraco HQ are uh, improving this kind of release by release, and this should be a constraint that, that disappears. And then there's session state. So um, a, if you have kind of front-end website users who are getting bounced around different front-end IS servers, and Braco by default uses improc session state, which is, you know, is stored, well, improc, I guess, uh, <laughs> somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but if they get bounced onto another server, then you need a resource that stores the session state across all of those servers. So those are the typical load balancing concerns. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Actually, that's not quite, that's not quite, um, I probably didn't articulate it very well. So if we, when we use DFS, we don't uh, exclude media. I guess what I was saying is in a, in a cloud setup, you could use something like a, um, a S3 or Azure CDN for storing your media. The, the main reason just being um, if you want to roll up another instance and you're using DFS, the media is normally the biggest folder. And you don't, and it takes a while to sync. So if you want an instance to come up quickly, it's often nice if the media is just up in a, a CDN, so it doesn't have to be moved around like the rest of the stuff. Yeah, it's just um, as I said, the slides are a little bit rushed. <laughs> so um, why not? Why go through all this aggravation? Why not just get a really big IS server um, and kind of maybe size it up and down and in terms of resources, well, you, you don't get an SLA for a single instance deployment in Azure, so you don't have any SLA for your deployment, and you'd be an idiot, because <laughs> if it goes, then your site is down. You know, some people, it's amazing, you meet customers all the time, and some of them are quite happy. They kind of go, well, if it goes down once a month for 20 minutes, that's fine. Uh, we don't really take that attitude. We don't kind of, we don't like to do unplanned outages. So uh, web roles, the, the concerns with web roles were they're, they're sort of no sticky load balancing, so you couldn't route through to that one back office instance. Uh, dodgy shared file system using the accelerator, try five times and so on. Um, hacky distributed calls, so to, to do the updating of the cache across the instances, it would actually go in, modify the Embraco config, you know, open up the XML and hack things in and out. Um, and, you know, it just all felt a little bit dirty. That's the technical term. So um, how can web roles work? Well, I, I kind of would say, again, um, at the end, if we have time for Q&A, Jevon's probably the, the expert on this, but I would prepare content on one instance, kind of test it ready to go, and then I would, I would scale up. When, when all the content was in place, but I wouldn't be really comfortable doing a, a site with continuous content updates in web roles. So then, this is the bit that changed because until this point yesterday, Azure VMs was my right way to do it, and now it's kind of my second way to do it because there's been some changes to, to Azure websites in the last few days. Um, so Azure VMs, as it says, you, you actually just spin up virtual machines Inside Azure, Windows Azure has a, a load balancer, and you can just say when traffic comes in on port 80, route it to, to one of my virtual machines. And it, it's, uh, you know, it's quite a nice way to, to set up. You can create a private network. You create a domain, a Windows domain on, one of, on your VM. You can set up DFS to move the files around. Um, and it's kind of a good deployment, but one would question the need to actually have all of these VMs unless it's more than the web app. So if you need to run a Windows service in the cloud or, or do something that actually requires some specific OS level, I it's quite a nice way to, to work and get set up. Um, and in fact, like I said, until recently, it was, it was just the way that we could do it. But there are some quirks with VMs. So, um, you know, there's this weird DHCP thing where a VM you can't give it a static IP. You have to give it, uh, it uses DHCP and it gets a lease forever. And it will keep that as long as you don't shut it down. If you shut it down, it dies. And if you, you know, if you give it a, st a static IP, it looks like it's working for a few hours. Then it kind of SMSs you to tell you you're a moron <laughs> in not so many words. Um, there's things like uh, availability sets. So um, you need to place your VMs into availability sets. Microsoft kind of sporadically will recycle these VMs. They'll restart them. They'll turn them off and on and off, off and on. Um, and unless your VMs are in different availability sets, in theory, they could get rebooted at the same time and you'd have an outage. Um, then you kind of have to do funny stuff because you're using DFS. You have to run your app pool as a domain user. So you've got consistent file permissions on the web route. It kind of goes on and on, really. 
But once you get there, once you've got a setup, it, it's really solid and it just works. Um, again, rerouting all the traffic to one back office was something I spent two weeks banging my head against the wall with until Stephen just kind of sent me a config file and went, that's how you do it. Thank you, Stephen. But then, kind of the point, really for me, of, of doing, the, as I said at the beginning, you might have different reasons for doing cloud deployments. You might just want to throw stuff up temporarily and take it down. But what I'm interested in is, is auto-scaling. So having cheap deployment, looking for demand, and as demand comes on board, kind of almost seamlessly just going, let's add some more in. Let's, let's have suddenly five, six instances without me having to get up in the middle of the night and, and press a button or two. So um, auto-scaling is frustrating. Um, with, with VM deployments at least. With, uh, so what you can do is you, could, you can, for example, have uh, four small VMs, four small-sized VMs, and when you start to notice traffic, you can go kind of make them big manually, kind of. You can do it with scripting and so on. And that will restart the VM and bring it back up in a bigger size. Um, you can kind of snapshot VMs, so you can bring them into bring them into play automatically. So you can kind of put triggers in and go when it gets busy, give me another VM. But because of all the the kind of load balancing requirements we've fulfilled, uh, sorry, we've we've created like domain membership and DFS membership. You, when your VM comes up, it kind of has to kind of do a bit of configuration here and there. Um, somebody, some people have scripts that do this and it does work, but again, it's not, it's not my cloud nirvana. I, I'm mildly OCD, by the way. <laughs> so um, I think, I mean, I've, I've kind of I've kind of covered this as well. So for example, if you bring in a new VM and you're using DFS, how do you know when DFS has finished syncing your files? How do you know when it's safe to start up IS and introduce it to the load balance and all that kind of stuff? So lastly, we've got um, Azure Websites, which is and always was probably the best way to do it because you had all of these uh, IS instances. You could kind of introduce them on demand and you could dispose of them on demand as well. And you had a shared file system and and actually you had a shared file system, I think it's called NextDrive or something. Uh, again, the HQ guys will know lots more about this. But it was, it was fast enough to actually, you could map a drive over it, all of your, all of your IS instances have access to it, and, and it's quick enough. But um, the main issue is that, that they can't talk to one another. And it's kind of almost by design. When one come, uh, becomes alive, the idea is it's a transient resource, this IIS. It, 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 you know, you shouldn't rely on it to be there forever. You should expect that it gets taken out and replaced with another, and that, that should be expected behavior. And if you come back to um, Embraco load balancing and distributed calls, that, that's a problem, because if you get a publish, then the IIS server that gets the publish needs to tell the others to update their caches, and you, you just can't do that. So that was, that is, was, depending on how you look at things, the, the fundamental problem. Um, also, you kind of, you can't exclude stuff from that shared file system, so you can't really just say, oh, well, by the way, um, have a, a local examine index and, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, perhaps it wasn't clear enough, by the way, the, the if you're not familiar with uh, Azure websites, you don't get any exposure to the OS. You say, have a website, uh, give me a website, and it, it basically, you have, it's like kind of old shared hosting. You upload your files into a place, and that place is a web route, and then you just kind of say, pile IS instances on top of that web route. So I can't go in and access IS and say, I uh, have a virtual directory pointing here and so on. But that problem, actually, you can get around. Um, so again, I would typically put media in a CDN. And there is a special uh, examine uh, index provider that allows you to write into blob storage, which will deal with writes from multiple instances. I think um, 
There's no way, unfortunately, though, to access one specific back office because, again, these are transient IS servers. You hit a domain and it will route you to any of them. Um, it is sticky. Once you, uh, now, this is a recent change, it used to be completely round robin, so you could get a different IS server on each request. By default, it's now sticky, so if there's one content editor, this would probably be fine because you wouldn't see inconsistency in the back office across multiple editors. Um, and again, some people might just say, I don't care actually if, if two content editors see a slightly different tree sometimes. You can be pragmatic about it and just go, actually, it doesn't matter. Um, but the cache thing was always the issue. Uh, and there's a Moriyama hack for updating the cache. I call it a hack because it kind of is at the moment, but conceptually it's sound. Um, and so the way we've started uh, rolling out Azure website setups, and when I say we've started, I mean yesterday at 9 o'clock in the evening, um, <laughs> is we have actually an Azure website with one instance in it for the back office, and that's got its own host name. And then we have another multi-instance Azure website deployment that uses the same database, and that's for the front end. And again, you could choose to make that kind of round robin uh, and whatever you wanted, but because we have a shared database, then then it kind of works. So the cache updating, the hack for updating the cache, it's it's quite boring and techy. Um, by the way, I also think that um, you know, again, Embraco are working on this kind of broad concept for six two, I think. So again, it will be there shortly. Um, what we do is when an Embraco instance comes up, it places the host name that it refers to itself by in a, a database table and a stamp as to when it was last alive. When there's a publish, the instance basically says what other instances are alive and it places a record of the publish in the database. It kind of leaves a message for all of the other instances. And it's the responsibility of eith, each instance to periodically check if it needs to update its cache. So we kind of push Rather, rather than the back office telling the other instances, each instance is responsible for, for kind of knowing what it should do. Probably better done with a service bus than a, a database. So it's all just still a bit too tricky, but it works really nicely. There's lots of, this is, <laughs> I don't know what that image is. I was getting really tired at this point. Um, <laughs> so um, there's just one more thing. Um, I'm going to use this opportunity to uh, get on my higher horse and have a sort of semi-rant about all of this stuff as a holistic general concept. It's just too complicated. Share simplicity, right? That's the, that's the new slogan. We're sharing simplicity, so we need to make it a lot more simple. It shouldn't be this hard. I know Embraco as a service is, is the goal, but um, you know, with the best will in the world, not all of my customers are going to want to do that now. Two minutes? Okay, so, um, by the way, if sandwiches are more appealing, then feel free to go. I'm not, not keeping you here. I think that what we should do is we should, um, we should have an Embraco runtime. So we should separate to content management, deployment, and runtime. Because the way I think about it, the, uh, the job of the CMS is to auth authentication and authorization for back office users. Notice I'm going quickly now. Uh, versioning of your content, uh, content entry, and content and data types. Because your runtime doesn't care what control you use to pick a node and, and all that kind of stuff. It's just the value by the time it gets to the runtime. And so basically, the deployment really should just be copying files from authoring to runtime. And there's loads of stuff that does that already, like Dropbox and rsync and Robocopy and FTP. And frankly, why reinvent the wheel? Why would we... Uh, want to do that again. So the runtime should really just deal with the latest version of published content only. It doesn't care about the versions in, in the database. There should be no relational database. So if we just deployed the latest current published content as a bunch of files, then the runtime should just pick that up and work from that. And yeah, there's other stuff like uh, user-generated content and website and visitor authentication, which, should, which might need a DB. But um, a truly 
cloud architected web app. Web servers should be considered temporary resources, added and removed at will, and agnostic of other instances. Somebody pointed out agnostic meant that they don't care about each other, and I think that's a, a fair reflection. So with Embraco, I'm really nearly done. Um, we could possibly, when you publish something, we could serialize the content to disk. Um, bit like the cache, but instead of one XML, uh, one big XML file, lots of XML in a, in a folder structure. And then we could copy those files up to our runtime. And, you know, we'd have to create a custom cache rather than the Embraco cache and have our own, you know, runtime. But in the back office, you could kind of incorporate that runtime for preview and, and so on. Um, integer IDs just need to die, guys. Uh, <laughs> seven is about, I got an applause from someone from HQ. That's, that's perfect. Integer IDs need to die. We need to basically, version seven is about the UI. Uh, beautiful idea. It, it, it's so much faster and better. How about version eight is about deployment and scale and making it a truly, you know, empowering cloud platform for CMS. Um, HQ are working on a lot of this. They know all about it. So don't worry, I'm not just a, a complete visionary. There's much more to Azure. <laughs> There's much more to Azure. Uh, seriously, if you want to ask Azure questions, um, I'll hang around. I'm not that hungry. Um, I, if I said anything that was bullshit, then let me know. We don't have time for a demo. How is it for you? All satisfied? Good. Any questions? No. Thank you very much.